Let's see, another example of a homemade would be what I call the Dobro Ode, which is basically a film canister uh, that I turn into a guitar. Hello, my name is Christopher Moorhead, and this is my tiny house I designed and built, and we are here on the outskirts of Asheville, North Carolina. Just a guy who uh, got sick of working a job he didn't love anymore to pay for a house that he didn't need to fill it with crap that was useless to impress people he didn't even like, so, yeah. I'm uh, someone who uh, really enjoys cooking. I used to be a professional uh, sous chef. And then I shifted gears and uh, got into healthcare and became an occupational therapist. Um, and during that process, I found myself making a lot of assistive devices and um, adaptive equipment for folks. And I developed uh, a love of woodworking. So I started uh, cobbling together a lot of things. And through the process of that, I kind of got into 3D editing, things of that nature, as those technologies kind of came about. And one day I just uh, was wondering, could you make a more creative staircase? So believe it or not, this house is totally designed around these, what you call alternating tread stairs. And uh, the whole idea was, uh, I just wanted to make something with the small footprints uh, that you could actually maximize all of the space for, for storage and things of that nature. The dimensions of this house are 32 feet long and 12 feet wide. It is built on foundation and it is a concrete crawl space foundation. This lot had been abandoned for quite some time before I got to it and I landscaped it all by myself and it's surrounded by woods and it is over, a little over half an acre but I'm surrounded by foliage and, and privacy and still a lot of room for sunlight for growing things. So if you'd like to come inside, take a look, I can show you now. Welcome to my home. Uh, this is relatively 384 square feet, not including the lofts. These are both actually classified as lofts. With the lofts, they're approximately 480 square feet. At the tallest point, it is actually 15 feet, and that really helped me get more of a sense of spaciousness. Another advantage uh, to having a little more space was that uh, I overcame one of the most difficult areas in my life to downsize, and that was my library. I did get rid of three bookshelves worth, but I was able to at least uh, rescue some of the essentials. It's also giving me a little bit more shelving space for some of my instruments that do not fit in my recording studio above, which we'll take a look at in a bit. One of the things that uh, I really wanted to do when you came in the entrance was have a closet where you could shed everything from the outside immediately. Put your shoes there, hang your coat up, charge your phone. It's all taken care of in one step, and when you're ready to exit the house, everything's there waiting for you. So a lot of people have asked what the design is on this door, and it's actually, for those who don't know, it's basically you take pieces of paper bag and you crumple them up, and then you use a mixture of half glue, half water, and then you apply it, sand it down, and then add a stain and then a varnish or a coat. I used armor seal in this case, and it gives the illusion somewhere between marble and leather. It's very inexpensive. It's very time consuming. So this specific aspect of the living room is 11 feet wide, and that is because I built bump-ins for the entrance. And the reason for that is threefold. One, it kind of gave a little extra dimension to an otherwise boxy structure. Secondly, it allowed me to put a little bit of a recess for more shelving and for the fireplace. You might notice I made a little bit of an entablature and enclosure for the fireplace, and I kind of wanted to give myself a little depth depending on what I was going to end up doing in the end. In the end, I went with a, uh, a Hampton fireplace. But the entablature itself, this is actually scraps that were left over from my loft beams, which 
I had a considerable amount and they were in 16 foot lengths. And while I was working on the living room, I found that I kept tripping over these things endlessly. So one day I had just had enough and I rage designed the entablature. And these are basically all the scraps that are left over. One of the things I like the most about the design is that I keep all of my peripherals for internet connection and uh, Blu-ray, et cetera, and the Wi-Fi. And that's all behind uh, basically rare earth magnets that are put on there and uh, that stays put uh, pretty much. A lot of the walls basically came from used scraps of flooring that I found. And a lot of people don't know this, but people bring their remaining flooring to Lowe's thinking they're going to get their money back and realize that Lowe's can't sell it. So they just kind of do away from it. So is this is a project that you'd find an investment. I certainly did. Um, it's a definitely a unique alternative to some of the other materials you may use for building. There's various types of woods uh, because they came from different uh, types of flooring, There's a, but they're all hardwoods, everything from oak to poplar to hickory. There might be some pele in there and some acacia, I believe. So how I got in, introduced into woodworking as a hobby, I decided to repurpose and redesign everyday objects into musical instruments, which has become a passion of mine as I love writing music and I love performing. So some of these are, are remnants of those days when I actually created uh, a lot of instruments. Uh, for instance, this is a uh, electric upright water cooler base. Uh, it's got weed whacker strings and you can see the water cooler bottle there. And we have a, a tambora that was made out of a cookie tin and some angler fishing uh, line. And we have a Celtic harp which was strung with weed whacker strings and fishing line. One other benefit to having a larger living room space is that I do have a pull-out futon. So if I have guests over, I can accommodate them. And also it's a full-size couch. So we have room for entertaining. And could ostensibly move all this back and form a dance floor, although I have yet to have the opportunity to have a dance party yet. So. I did want the idea of passive solar, so I waited for three seasons before I decided exactly where I would build the house. I did try to line it up with the giant oak tree in the back so it would be in the middle to give it a little bit of symmetry, which is probably noticed as a theme throughout the house. So in my search for land in the area to be closer to family, I was mostly looking for open use lots. And what that basically means is that you don't necessarily need permits or variances for most structures. So you can freely build things. However, things quickly changed almost within a couple of weeks of I me mean, getting my camper here. My, you know, to, so I figured that was the best way to, to buck having to pay rent was just park the camper on my open use lot and then I could just build away. But the city council decided to change the zoning up here. They changed it to our three zoning, which is residential zoning. It allows you up to three structures. However, it's you need to get permits. No uh, trailer builds. So I decided to take the opportunity, take the lemons and make uh, lemon meringue pie. And I decided I'd build on foundation. I was learning some things from living in a camper which uh, one of the biggest things were that eight and a half feet may be a bit too small for my own needs and uh, my own clumsiness, admittedly. So I decided if I was on foundation, there was no real reason to stay limited to road regulations and I could push things out and maybe push up the lofts a little bit, give yourself a little headspace. So I was inspired greatly by Frank Lloyd Wright. I think he was kind of the master of doing designs at angles. And I really wanted to capture that with this Japanese Tansu style design in the loft windows. I wanted everything to be open and spacious, but also give a sense of privacy, but at the same time for circulation and also just for that airy open feeling. So moving up, we have a little bit more of the view of the what I call the Julia balconies uh, to each loft. And I wanted to give it a little bit more character. So what I thought of doing was uh, repurposing some uh, wine bottles, which a friend was nice enough to secure for me. They're both the same on both sides. They're fused together. So these are both on the inside and the outside of the loft walls. You'll notice going into the bathroom, the little small hallway in here, on the left I have more paper bag flooring and over here there's more found scraps of 
hardwood flooring and engineered flooring. I did design the door around an old shower door. Uh, my folks had given me when they were remodeling their own bathroom and uh, I decided that this would be my first room I experimented with in building and kind of going a little nuts creatively. The corks did take a while. The collection was started actually by my mother who gave me a couple bags of corks and thought I could use it in a design. I got a little creative and obviously once I ran out of those, no, my mother did not drink this much wine. There was a couple local wine bars who were more than happy to part with the wine corks. As a matter of fact, if you ever need any for crafts of any type, you know, hit your local wine bar. They usually have way more than they can deal with. You're doing them a favor. My father, on the other hand, had a lot of cigar boxes to contribute. And this made the family feel more that they were involved in the process since they couldn't really be part of the building aspect. So there are cigar boxes throughout this design aesthetic as well, working with the mosaic. And they make uh, pretty functional cabinets for all sorts of uh, aspects, everything from the, uh, the vanity to the sink. One of the things I was most concerned about was how would I get into the sink if I had problems with plumbing? So what I did is I basically put each of these on rare earth magnets and then just attach some leftover flashing from the outside of the house to those and that way they stick in there, but you can actually gain access to the plumbing workings. The joke uh, between the cigar boxes and, uh, and the wine courts being contributed uh, by my folks, as I say that this is the house that was built on my parents' vices. So. One of the advantages to having built alternating tread staircases is that I was able to exploit the opposite sides and these made uh, great bins and cubby hatches and they are all of different depths. At the bottom section I added a little more structural foundation so there's actually cubby hatches in the front of those steps. So behind the door, once you shut this, is another closet. And this is actually a multi-purpose room. I'd always thought it was the strangest task taking your laundry from your bedroom to another room to wash it, to just take it to yet another room to fold it and distribute it back to the original room it came from. It made more sense to me ergonomically to have this all take place in one space. So this is a Splendid washer and dryer, which is usually a staple that's uh, used in the RV community. And uh, it served me very well for over six years. Uh, again, more reclaimed, uh, there's reclaimed cork flooring, uh, hardwood floors, a little bit of spruce. So it's a little bit of cobbled everything together, but I had put a little bit of a fold out table on here. So once you're done, you can fold all your laundry and then stick it away right there. So I'd gotten a really good steal at a local surplus company on a set of a corner shower doors uh, for 40 bucks. When I took it home, it was brand new in a box from 1996, hadn't been open. And as it turned out, it was a $1,200 jacuzzi unit. So talk about a good score. Moving on to the other side of the house, we have the kitchen. And I had to come up with a pretty creative way to make a facade for the breakfast bar behind the cabinets. And I had two pieces of plywood. They obviously weren't big enough. They were rough cuts. So what I did is I actually captured what is known as an ADSR envelope, which is a tax uh, decay sustain and release, which is the basis for all sounds. And it's pretty much known in the music world that this is what a sound wave looks like. And not only that, but it had the additional meaning of looking like a mountain during a sunset. All right, so coming into the kitchen, the kitchen probably took longer than any other room in the house. And at this point, I felt pretty confident with my carpentry skills. Again, I used the same technique where I used hardwood flooring. This I used mostly blonde since you wanted a light area to work with while you're doing cooking and some of the other features. I felt that cabinets were a little claustrophobic. You lose things behind them, you don't know where they are. This way you can actually see things and have pretty quick access. Since I wasn't going to have a cabinet, I would get some shelving. So this is basically just simple IKEA shelving. I'm just hanging it right over the sink. And when you're done with your dishes, you just put them away and they dry. Another solution I wanted to find was access to spices. 
I do a lot of cooking, uh, being a former sous chef, so I wanted to have that access close to me. Basically what these are is little magnetized jars. And again, this was leftover flashing from the outside of the house, and I put them inside cigar boxes, and it just is a nice, easy way to have your spices readily available at your fingertips. Now for my drop down lights over the bar, I ended up using the remaining parts of the wine bottles that I'd used for the portal windows for the lofts. Much like in the bathroom, I have basically the mirror image uh, as far as pantry cupboards. Another advantage of having pushed out the walls in my original design was that I could now have a full size fridge. And of course, I'm a big fan of French doors and I'm also a big fan of bottom loaders. The great concept about this and where it is located in the pantry is if I am actually cooking, I can actually reach over here without stepping into the pantry to get my items. Or if I only need something that's in the door, I don't have to move very far. Another aspect, uh, there was a lot of space that was going on back here. Uh, next to the fridge and I was finding a lot of things like the vacuum cleaner were just being thrown back there in a state of clutter. So what I ended up doing was taking all the scraps that were left over from the kitchen project and making a pullout. And so basically this has everything I need as far as electronics up above. I have my cordless vacuum cleaners uh, charging there and then I have all of my dried goods. So my budget for this house was $80,000 mostly because I had decided to go on, on board with uh, working with the, you know, with planning and development and doing it right. With the land that I'd gotten, uh, which I got a steal for, 26000 it also included a two-bedroom septic tank. The next room is, uh, we'll take a look at it as the bedroom. And on the way, I guess I'll talk a little bit about my staircase. So basically the difference between this and a regular set of stairs is it's a little more like a ladder. It's actually right in between a ladder and a staircase. And the idea is that each foot has a separate cadence when you're using them going up or down. All right, so up here in the loft bedroom, basically what I've done is I wanted to let a little more sunlight in but give myself some privacy. I found a pretty good score, two polarized shower glass doors that I used as windows and I've used those on both lofts for both the bedroom and for the quarry studio. And then for the backdrop, I want to make the world's largest headboard, mm -hmm. which is basically, these are just uh, a total collection of cigar boxes and lids, and I pieced them together to make a pattern. So a little bit more about the design aesthetic. I really wanted an open kind of balcony-esque feel that just overlooked everything and let sunlight in from the windows when you were up in the loft. And when we wake up in the morning, kind of gives you a feeling you're up in the trees a little bit, which we are here on the mountain. You can also see from this side, the other side of the wine bottles that I'd fused together. And, and it's the same on the other side. Everything is uh, symmetrical as far as that's concerned for the recording studio, which is what I'll show you next. This is the recording studio. Um, it is probably the biggest reason that I was happiest doing a bit of an expansion on the house when I was designing and building it. Mostly because either way I would have had to build a separate structure and heat it and provide electricity and it just seemed like it made more sense to just push the walls out, lift the ceiling up and actually make this space in here work for me. Music is probably my biggest passion in life. I love playing instruments, I love composing music, and I do a little bit of soundtracking here and there. It's been a while. It's definitely a don't give up your day job job, and it's mostly for the fun and the passion. If you could say anything, I like collecting sound. How about that? The biggest problem you have in any recording studio especially when this small, is slapback and reverberation from all of the acoustics that are going on. So the way you manage this is through uh, two techniques. One is called, 
absorption rather, is usually handled through foam, which I have these up for. And then with the scraps, more scraps of sapele, and also the triangles that were cut off of the leftover framing from the house, I was able to make reflectors. Basically, if you think of sound of kind of like water, you're able to distribute it and have it splash in other areas, and then it controls a lot of echoes and feedback and comb filters and things of that nature. And so this seemed to be a really great setup for me, and it's worked so far with both live instrumentation and for listening. Uh, when I'm doing mix downs for songs, but I did put them on giant command strip Velcro in case I did need to move things around if it didn't work out. I do play traditional instruments, but I also, as I'd mentioned, make my own. And uh, one of the things that I uh, made over the past few years was a set of uh, conduit tubular bells. And uh, this can be seen here. All right, uh, let's see. Another example of a, a homemade would be what I call the Dobra Ode, which is basically a film canister uh, that I turned into an old guitar. Because I'm in such a small space, I needed to come up with a workflow which would allow me to move around in a circle and to be able to record and mix and play instruments very quickly and in, in a short period, be able to return back to my main recording workstation. Over here, I have basically my collection of synthesizers. It's quite a lot, yeah. <laughs> I do enjoy synthesis, but I'm also very big into organic music as well as you can see. Big string instruments, that's how I got my start. Here, this is more the rhythmic section. Everything from drums to percussion and then some. Over here are my, basically my guitar peripherals. Moving over to here, this is, as far as I know, uh, pretty unique for a tiny house. Uh, this is actually a full-size piano. It also serves as my workstation for doing most of the recordings. The whole journey of building this house ironically became something of a philosophical and spiritual journey for me because I was able to really take responsibility for all my own thoughts ideas, feelings, and uh, any time I made a mistake with something I was doing, it, it was my responsibility and my fault. I had no one to blame. And you stop and you realize that by doing this exercise, you become better at doing it with people, even though you're doing it by yourself. And suddenly you start to see when other people are doing it and you become more understanding and forgiving and empathetic with that as well. So it actually made me a more loving and kind person through doing the work by myself. I think through that, another aspect of the wabi-sabi is, you know, you, you start to develop this pattern where you starting off from ground zero, you don't know what you're doing. I intentionally start off in the bathroom because I had a lot of wild ideas. And I also knew that by the time I was done the house, I'd kind of be cringing at the work I'd done and you don't spend much time in a bathroom, so it's not really a big deal, right? You know, you just go and do your business, get out. So it was a good experimental uh, room. The irony being, by the time I got to the other side of the house, I found myself looking down my nose at the person I was, because I'd become so much further. But had it not been for that journey from those steps, then I never would have accumulated the knowledge and the experience of building the rest of the house to get to that point. And so that, I guess, is where the idea of the aesthetic of Wabi Sabi comes in. It's like, appreciate your journey because that's how you got there. It's never about some arrival point. And uh, it's always have those reminders of your imperfections, you know, to remind you how far you've come. Not, not to cringe at, to appreciate, you know? It's like, wow, look at the growth, you know? watching our video and for stopping by Tiny House Expedition. I'm Alexis. And I'm Christian. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And for more tiny home tours and stories, click the videos below. And join us on Instagram for bonus content. 
including face-to-face -face conversations with us. <laughs> we hope to see you there. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.